researcher bias cannot be avoided. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you do know what I mean, yeah? <laughs> no, I'm gonna restart. No! <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of the Alwyn Swifties podcast. We're your hosts, Olympia, Davidson and Annalise, and today we have a very special guest joining us all the way from China. Everyone say hello to Yi Shui! Beautiful. Uh, today we'll be focusing on the challenge of climate change and consumer responsibility throughout four different journal articles. We'll delve into the idea that different methods produce different data and how all research processes come with their own limitations to be aware of. The first article, titled Tourist Perceptions of International Air Travel's Impact on the Global Climate, discusses its research through a constructivist ontology and an interpretivist epistemology. It questions whether tourists feel that they have more of an impact on global climate change due to their air travel and of the, pos and of, and of the potential policies to prevent climate change. The sample is targeted to international travellers and the method used is focus groups. Now I'll pass it on to you, Shwe. Thank you, Annalise. Um, the article I looked at called Who is Reading the Label? Millennials' Use of Environmental Product Labels. It uses foundationalist ontology and critical realist epistemology. The research question is trying to seek to understand teenagers' desire in taking socially responsible actions of buying environment-friendly products while explaining to us specifically what certain factors would influence their decision making. It takes sampling of students in college as their convenience sample. Now I'll pass it over to Olympia. Thank you, Yishui. Um, titled Greeting the Poor, The Trap of Moralization, my article explored the tension between individual responsibility for the environment and inequality, and how this is portrayed and acted upon through a government program. Utilising a constructivist ontology and interpretivist epistemology, the study used observation methods and interviews to observe a government program in France, which focused on helping poorer households green their lifestyles. Hadrian Mallier, the researcher, observed discussions between volunteers of the Earth Ambassadors organization and participants and reflected on the themes of those discussions by connecting them to issues of poverty and environmental responsibility. What about you, Davidson? Thanks, Olympia. So my journal is entitled Informing Decision Making on Climate Change and Low Carbon Futures, framing narratives around the United Kingdom's fifth carbon budget. The author Candace Howard poses the research question on how narratives can build social support for a transition to a low carbon future. This paper's exploration of narratives depicts how social discourses are the main impetus to social change and therefore upholds a constructivist ontology and an interpretist epistemology in its research design. So I'll first be comparing and contrasting my article with Olympia's and first I would just like to establish just how inherently different these two articles are. So my article utilised 30 semi-structured interviews with UK academics in UK, obviously, and your article utilised an ethnography to uh, observe the life of low-income households. One aimed to produce discussion and discourse, whereas the other aimed to actively engage with participants and collect data through observation. Naturally, the, uh, these two studies produced, uh, experienced rather, very different limitations and drawbacks that affected the outcome of the research. So for the UK study, the UK academics uh, discuss theoretical narratives that may incite a positive behavioural change in those who are less inclined to adopt a greener lifestyle. Now, this is all good, but it is critical that we consider the different uh, positionalities between the UK academics and those of lower socioeconomic backgrounds who experience a whole different set of social struggles that the wealthier academics may not understand. Uh, therefore, the narratives produced in the interviews, for example, uh, visualizing a brighter, more sustainable future may not actually be sustainable in practice, whether due to structural reasons, uh, cultural issues, or uh, financial issues that present issues like having a roof over your head or putting food on the plate as more important and dire than combating global warming. Now, I find it very interesting that with Olympia's article, although having a completely different research design, also experienced similar issues with positionality. Um, now, specifically with the researcher, whereas in the UK study, it was with the interviewees. Now, as discussed by Walter, 
this is almost like an inherent element of all qualitative research, whereby the interpreter's epistemological position recognizes that researcher bias cannot be avoided. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we can practice reflexivity. Exactly. Like, we can only try to be aware of how positioning society will affect the research outcome. But uh, that's not all the issues the front study had to face because the participants and the uh, volunteers may view the researcher as an outsider due to their higher social status and therefore be less inclined to share their personal experience. And by and large, regardless of the method or the sampling strategies chosen, there will still be limitations and drawbacks that will affect the efficacy of the data collected. Uh, what do you think, Olympia? I definitely agree with the limitations you found in my study, Davidson. I compared my study to Yishui's study, and I found that both articles used different ontological and epistemological positions. Within the survey, the use of a critical realist perspective led to data which suggested that people's purchasing decisions are inherent because of a number of separate criteria, and that these uh, criteria can be found through a number of simple research uh, survey questions. Contrastingly, Malier uses a constructivist and interpretivist perspective, which, as defined by Marsh, acknowledges that the world is interpreted by those within it. Uh, this is why he uses observation methods to examine how volunteers phrase environmental responsibility and notices their use of economic arguments to try to get the participants to change their lifestyles. It is this interaction and the use of moral arguments, particularly by volunteers, that his constructivist position recognises as valuable in the conversation about environmental responsibility. Comparing mine and Yishui's articles, the different ontological positions led the two studies on completely different paths from the beginning of the research process and affected what data was seen as valuable by the end of the study. One suggested that answers to questions was important to understand consumer decisions, and the other recognised the importance of discussion and reasoning in the issue of environmental responsibility. It cannot be said that one perspective is better than another, but I would say within the issue of environmental responsibility and climate change, it is important to see how citizens react, um, whether they react positively to government programs that focus on sustainable living. And I believe that that is what the observation method can provide. Clearly, however, the different methods and ontological perspectives used came with their own limitations. What did you find, Yishui? I also noticed a few limitations both in our articles. For example, my article didn't involve any researchers and their active interactions in the study. That led to the lack of the understanding of teenagers' perceptions in further depth. Readers may be interested in researchers' opinions as well. On the other hand, analysts' article used focus groups, research with voluntary participants. Yet it's notable that people who are more interested in climate change and the environmental issues are more likely to attend which may have affected the accuracy of data with bias. Other similar biases related to people's perceptions would be their personal backgrounds. Interviewees in analyst article are people all from New Zealand, as we know, a highly developed country, so it won't be as convincing to represent perceptions of all types of international air travel tourists. For example, it excluded, um, in this case, it excluded tourists from a less developed country background, and it would be a pity to not hear from them. And um, what what did you find, analysts? Yeah, so I was comparing mine and Davidson's articles, and what I found really interesting was for Davidson's interviewees, they were sent the final transcript of their interviews, whereas my focus groups weren't sent any kind of transcript. What I find really interesting here is to debate whether it's an ethical problem or not. Is it okay because what was said in the focus groups was already said around a group of people and humans naturally sense themselves when they're with a group of people? Um, as mentioned in the Roberts and Ravine reading, focus groups do not necessarily reflect the real values of people within groups. Um, I think the fact that people normally sense themselves within a group of people means that there isn't really that much of an ethical problem. Um, and it creates interesting data itself to compare um, the opinions discussed. This helps us understand the censoring that naturally occurs of people within focus groups and perhaps the limitation this creates to finding people's real opinions. However, it is arguable that people's, um, people masking their true opinions is data in itself. 
Definitely. I think we found here today that um, no matter what recent process is utilised, they all come with limitations. Yeah, the observation methods, focus groups and interviews use the pistol these limitations when discussing the issues of climate change and consumer responsibility. Hmm, and I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you guys so much for tuning into another episode of Alan Swifties. Make sure to subscribe, hit that bell button so you're notified when we uh, go live next time and stay swifty. Thank yes. you so much, Yishui, for calling us order from China and we'll see you guys next week. Uh-huh.